I just wanted to share with you guys a little bit about a ministry that I run with a group of really passionate believers called Kingdom Living Ministries. And um, as Kingdom Living Ministries, we really believe that Christianity should be the most exciting thing. And we are so passionate about equipping and empowering Christians to live the life that they've always dreamed of, to learn what it means to live like Jesus lived, that signs and wonders should follow us and that our regular lives should no longer be regular, that we can expect to see God move when we're in Sainsbury's, when we're picking the kids up from school, when we're at work, when we're with our families, and there are four main areas that we teach on um, at Kingdom Living Ministries. The first one is intimacy with God. What are practical steps that we can take to get closer to God? Secondly, we look at identity. When we know that God is on our side and what he's called us for and what's possible in his kingdom, that it actually belongs to us, our whole life can change. The third thing that we look at is supernatural lifestyle. So we teach people what it means to hear God's voice for yourself, for other people, to live a supernatural lifestyle where we're moving in the gifts of the spirit in prophecy, we're seeing healings regularly when we pray for people. We knocked on the window and they opened the door and they were like, sorry guys, you have to like order online. And we were like, we're not ordering anything, we wanna ask a question, um, but do any of you have back pain? And the guy who opened the door, he was like laughing to his friends, he was like, yeah, I do, like I have back pain. And we're like, cool, we just really felt like God told us that someone in here had back pain and that we wanted, um, and that God wanted to heal you. So um, we um, asked if we could pray and he was like, yeah, okay. So he was kind of laughing with his friends and we're like, okay. So I started praying and I, and I as soon as I started praying, his face completely changed because he was laughing and kind of making a joke out of it. And then he literally just turned to like shock, like it was really, really cool. So he, he was like staring off in the distance, not giving me eye contact anymore. And then afterwards, I was like, so how do you feel? And he goes, I didn't actually expect that to work. And I was like, whoa. I just immediately felt peaceful. And, and to just be quiet and, and um, I've got the phone to my ear and I've got my eyes closed and I'm just sensing some stuff going on and, and I asked her, is anything happening? And she said, uh, she said yeah, it's, it's, um, it's getting warm. Cool, okay. So I, I prayed a very short uh, prayer. Lord, just bless this back. Um, I, I told her that uh, I bless her and, and that um, I commanded the pain out of her body. And uh, I says, anything happening? She says, yeah, it's, the, the pain's gone. I really want to encourage you to think and to pray about whether you would like to join Kingdom Living Ministries. This October, we're starting new courses. We have a part-time course in person, which runs every Thursday for nine months from October to July, every Thursday in term time, from half 10 till half four. If you wanna know more, you can check the website. It's www.kingdomlivingministries.co.uk. You can send me a message. You can get in touch with me, speak to me any way that you want to. Um, but I would really, really like to encourage you to think and pray about joining us this October. Bless you guys, enjoy your day, lots of love. Good morning. Today we are kicking off our new series of 21 days of prayer and fasting. So over the next three weeks, we'll be having more conversational style preaches. And that is starting with us today. We'd love to encourage you, though, on the live stream to get involved. So we are going to ask you to send in some questions for us. You have two options when it comes to sending in questions. The first option is sending in a question for me to ask my dad, Ian, live today. And the second option is to send in a question for my dad, Ian, to ask me live today. So we'd love for you to send those in and we'll be answering them a little bit later on. But before then, I've got some questions for you. So every year as Restore, we have our Vision Sundays. Why do we do this? And why do you think it's important for a church to have a vision? That's a great question, Emma. I wonder where you got that one from. <laughs> <laughs> I've given Emma some, some questions to get us started today. Um, for me, um, 
I think vision is probably the most important gift um, that a leader can give to a church. And I think vision is really important for our own lives as well. I think everyone um, wants to achieve something with their life. I think everyone is born with a sense of my life must have some sort of significance and must have some sort of purpose. And I think when you find your vision, really what you're finding is your, is your life call. And as much as we have a life call as a individual, I think together as a church, we have a life call as well. And so I think every church has a calling. The reason it's come into being is because God has a plan and a purpose for it. And and that is our vision. And so I think the role of church leadership is to discern what that vision is and then to help lead the church forward into that direction. There's a, there's a well-known verse in Proverbs, Proverbs 29, verse 18, that says, um, where there is no vision, then the people perish. And uh, literally that says, if there is no vision, then the people are unrestrained, which in, in, to my understanding means if we haven't got any vision or any focus for our lives, then we wander all over the place and we can end up getting lost. And as much as I think that's true for us, I think that's also true for churches as well. Yeah. And so I think we need to periodically keep going back to God and saying, God, what is the thing that you've called us to? God, what are you saying to us for this next season? And how do we more closely align ourselves to that? And so we do the two seasons of 21 prayers, 21 weeks of prayer and fasting. Um, and in that time, we use it to revisit our vision and to refocus on, okay, God, what are you saying to us overall? What have you said to us overall as Restore? But also, what is our next step? So in this next season, what are the next things that we need to be doing? So, so I think for all of us, we should be asking God, what is our vision? What is our calling? What is our purpose? Why am I alive? And kind of record that, but then regularly reflect on it as well. And I think it then really helps us to start to step forward into the things that God's called us to. Mm -hmm. So what is the vision that you then carry for Restore as a church? Yeah, well, um, for me, the, the vision of Restore comes from Isaiah chapter 61, verse and a few years ago, uh, we felt that God was saying to us that he wanted to give us a, a new name and step into a new season. And uh, when we prayed through that process, the verse that God gave us was from Isaiah 61. And he, it, it, Isaiah 61 talks about rebuilding the ancient ruins, so rebuilding the things that are broken and also restoring the places that are devastated. And we felt that God called us as a church, as a community, as a people, to be people who carry God's heart for restoration. And obviously that's in Isaiah 61. And when Jesus was here on earth, when he uh, first declared his ministry, his purpose, so his vision, in Luke chapter four, he chooses to quote from Isaiah 61. And he quotes the first two verses, but he says, God's spirit is on me and he's called me to bring good news to the poor. He said, he's called me to bring freedom for the prisoners. He's called me to bring recovery of sight to the blind. And he's uh, called me to set free the oppressed. And he's called me to bring about or to release the favour, the favourable year of God. And so as a church, I think that's what we're called to. And when you think about that verse, I think there's a few things that it says. Number one, it says it's God's spirit working through us. And so one of the things I passionately believe as a church is that we are all about the spirit of God. That's why I love this set design and the opportunity these 21 days gives us to again, open our lives and say, God, will you fill me with your spirit? God, I need your presence in me. Thank you that you want to put your presence in me, but I need to live with your presence in me. Mm -hmm. And I think when we carry God's presence in us, then we start to reflect God's heart. And I think God's heart is good news to the poor. When you look at the life of Jesus, he always, always went to the marginalized. And uh, when you go through the rest of those, those verses, it talks about freedom for the prisoners. And Jesus didn't literally break anyone out of jail but he set lots of people free from captivity of sin, captivity of sickness, uh, demonic uh, possession, uh, uh, oppression. It, it then talks about uh, recovery of sight to the blind and there's so many stories where Jesus brought physical healing to people, but also so many stories where Jesus brought insight and an understanding. And, and I think sight can sometimes be a physical sight. Sometimes it can be just an insight and an understanding. And then it talks about setting free the oppressed. And Jesus did lots and lots of embracing people from other nations that were feeling excluded in, in uh, spending time with people that the religious leaders of the day wouldn't have spent any time with. Um, and then he, it finishes by talking about the year of Jubilee, 
So if you know your Old Testament, you'll know that uh, every seven years they were meant to have a, a, a year of Sabbath. But every seven times seven, every 49th year, they were meant to have a double Sabbath. And in the second of those Sabbath years, everyone was meant to be released of their debts. All the slaves were meant to be set free. Everyone was meant to get back their original inheritance. And I think when Jesus was talking and quoting Isaiah 61, he was saying, God wants to set you free from your debts. He wants to set you free from your history. He wants you to know that you're loved, that you're valued, that you have a purpose and an inheritance. And he wants to restore all of that to you and as a church I want to be a, I, I want to lead a church I want us to be a church community that believe all of those things and experience them experience them happening in our lives and through our lives into the lives of other people it's just an incredible vision that we have for a church can you tell us any stories from your life that have helped you in forming this vision for the church yeah um I um I was quite a shy teenager, so you're doing incredibly well to be on TV in front of people doing this at, at 18. Um, I, never, I never would have done that at your age because I was quite a shy, um, insecure teenager. I, I, I then went to uni, as you're going to go soon, um, and uh, it was there I met someone and became a Christian. Um, and when I got filled um, with God's spirit, something happened in my heart um, and... I think I started to feel God's heart for other people like never before. And when I was um, first training uh, with the church, because uh, when I got filled with the Spirit, it's like something broke inside me. And I knew that the things that I thought I would live my life for and the direction I thought I would go um, in um, was all going to change. And so I ended up training for uh, ministry and, and to work in the church. And as a part of that, I got put on, a, an, on quite a tough estate in South London. Um, and um, I encountered two people, really. I, I, I'll get on to, to telling you about those. But um, their story touched me enormously. So, so there was a guy called Jerry. I, I'd worked on this estate for about two weeks. And we got put into contact with a guy called Jerry who'd um, lived his life living on the streets of London, um, was a, a, a hardline drug um, heroin addict um, who then met Jesus. Um, and his backstory was in, incredible. He grew up in Ireland. Um, he was physically abused by his dad, um, as was his, his, he and his brother. Um, one day he went out um, to play outside and he heard a gunshot. Um, and when he went back in, his brother had committed suicide um, out of the pain and the brokenness of the family. So Jerry ran away from home, um, managed to get over to the UK um, and lived on the streets of London, got involved in all sorts of crime and, and everything else. His whole life was a, was a mess. Um, and I first met him, I, I was the same age as him, um, but actually I had nothing in common with him apart from being male and in my 20s every bit of my life story was so different mm. um, and initially I had no idea how I was going to relate to him um, because he just seemed so different his life experience was so different to me um, and I asked God to help me and uh, I felt like God said just love him and I spent the next five years of my life just trying to love Jerry and walk his journey with him. And because his, his situation was so extreme, because his life was so broken, um, that was really hard and really painful. Um, and so I went with him, I took him to rehab. Um, I went and collected him when he'd run away from rehab and took him back to rehab. Um, I went with him to uh, preach on the underground in London used to go in, in tube carriages and, and preach between the stations uh, to people about Jesus or stand on tube platforms. Went with him to churches when he went to give his testimony. Um, I went to visit him in prison when he got caught in crime again um, and ended up getting arrested. Um, and I, I just went through a whole load of stuff with um, Jerry. But I think what I learned was I learned that if I'd been through the things that he'd been through... I probably would have been exactly the same as him. And I think we so easily think, oh, that's that person, oh, they're an addict or they're homeless. Um, and we don't think about the backstory. And I think when we learn, the reality was with, with Jerry, I was on a huge learning curve. Um, 
and, and I realised that we're all broken, but I realised that everyone's got a story. And if you understand their story, you understand why they're where they are, and that Jesus wants to come and make a difference for that, and that we need to view people with the eyes of Jesus, not just our eyes. Otherwise, we'll never lead them into a place that we can embrace them with God's love, but also bring them to a place of, of freedom. So there's, there's these two people, there was Jerry, the other one was, was a lady called Teresa, and uh, I was watching Lauren's video and seeing the folk from KLM, obviously before lockdown, offering free hugs, because you couldn't do that now. Um, but just some of the ways they were trying to take God's love out onto the streets. And uh, we used to do that as well. And uh, we were singing by a bus stop. There's five or six of us doing an, an, an open air. So we were kind of the worship team by, by a bus stop trying to tell people about Jesus. I'm sure we not, weren't great singers. So I'm not sure we were doing a great job with that in a way. Um, and this lady walked up with two small kids. And she stood and listened to us for a little while. She had some carrier bags, I remember. Um, and she would have been about 30. Um, and I walked over and I started to talk to her. And she um, was an alcoholic, and she had uh, drunk, um, lost everything through um, her alcoholism, had managed to get her life together, um, got in a relationship, um, had two kids, fit and healthy, and then the relationship had broken up, and she'd just begun to drink again. And in her carrier bag, she had some food for the kids and some alcohol for her. And she heard us talk about the power of Jesus to set one, someone free. Um, and it made her ask the question, could that be true for me? Um, and so we got to know her, we started to visit her, and it um, breaks my heart when I think about it. One day we went around to knock on her door, and she wasn't there anymore, because she had rung her mother, got her to come and look after the kids, and then run away, because she hadn't been able to stop drinking. Um, and we managed to track her down to, um, to a women's refuge in Clapham. Um, and she managed to get herself together and find freedom from her drinking. But again, she had an incredible backstory and an incredible amount of pain. And I think I just woke up, I just woke up to the fact that this is, the real, this is real life for many people. And I think it's so easy to get so self-absorbed and to think my reality is everyone's reality. And I was put in a context when I realized that just around the corner from me were people in enormous pain and brokenness with nowhere to turn and no one seemingly paying any interest or willing to walk the journey with them. And I think it broke something in me because I realized that's who Jesus has come for. You know, Jesus has come for you. Jesus has come for me. But if ever there was someone that needed to meet the love and the power of Jesus, it was a Jerry, it was a Teresa, and the countless of other people that I've met like that since. And like I say, it changed me into knowing that everyone has a story. And I think what true church is meant to be is a place where no one's judged no one um, feels that they need to hide their story there's no shame and there's real unconditional love that accepts all and embraces all and that welcomes all, no matter. I've run house groups where people have, have sat there in the middle of the house group and, and, and opened um, a can of tenants and, and drunk it because they haven't yet known Jesus or they've been on a journey to it. And I've been fine with that because I want church to be a place where everyone knows that they're loved, everyone knows that they're valued, everyone knows that they belong and that we together we'll try and point our way towards Jesus because none, none of us have got it sussed. Mm. You know, none of us today, we might not be in the extremity that, that Jerry was in or Teresa, or maybe we are, um, but we're all broken people who've met the grace of a loving God who wants to help us to journey forward towards a place where we can find freedom and healing. And for me, some of those individual encounters is what has taught me 
that God loves everyone, that God's for everyone, and that actually as a church, we've got to, got to be about that. We've got to be about the people in our community. You know, this morning, we might be tuning in. I don't know what our biggest worry is. Maybe is our kids going back to school tomorrow? I know that can be a big thing. I know that can be a serious thing for people. But really, someone not knowing whether they can stay with their kids tomorrow because of their drinking. You know, that might be the situation with my next door neighbour. It might be the situation with a person just round the corner from me. Mm. I need to have eyes that look out for a bigger world and say, do you know, Jesus has sent me to be the answer to that. And if that's how Jesus lived his life, that's how I want to live my life. And that's how God wants us as a church to be, because that's what the love of God looks like in practice. I know it's a long answer, probably longer than you were anticipating, but it has to all be about people and loving them with the unconditional love of Jesus. Mm. Allowing God to break our hearts for what breaks his. Yeah, And totally. then use that in order to love one another. Totally. So today we're starting our 21 days of prayer and fasting. How does that fit into the vision that you have for us all? I, I think in a couple of ways. I think... Um, before Jesus did anything, he fasted and prayed, and he knew that, that there was power in the addictions and the demonic stuff that held people back. Mm. And he knew that to break that, he needed God's power. And to get that, he needed to lay down some things to make more space for the power of God. You know, Jesus says to his disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane when they fall asleep, he says, watch and pray. In other words, be alert. Because he says, your spirit is willing, but your flesh is weak. And so often, not only do we get distracted, but I think, I, I think we feed our flesh and we starve our spirit. And then we wonder when we can't see people set free from some of these things. You know, what stirred me, I, I know that I've said this before, but when I went to Hong Kong at the start of the year and spent some time with Jackie Pullinger, they so move in the power of the spirit but they so journey with broken people. They've seen amazing life transformations. People like Jerry and Teresa being transformed by the power of God's spirit. And, but it is all by the power of God's spirit. And if we're not serious about what we're called for, we'll never get there. But if we're not serious about the fact that, that we need the power of God and we need to lay down some things, we need to lay down the distractions, we need to lay down the things that we often use to comfort ourselves. We need to get those out so we can get ourselves full of the word of God, full of the power of God's spirit. Then God will work through us like, like this design. Then God will work through us. The power of God will work out of us to start to bring a change around us. But we need to get serious about it. You know, one of the things that, that surprises me is how little these days you hear churches talk about fasting, about laying down things. We can so easily say, oh, come to Jesus and all your problems will be solved. That isn't true, but that actually isn't true Christianity. Come to Jesus and he will wipe away your past. He will forgive you of that stuff. He will heal you of your brokenness, but he'll do it for a purpose. And the purpose is that so our lives can be poured out for a bigger world it's because there's, there's part of a bigger call. And so he doesn't want us to become fat Christians just filling our own needs. He wants us to be radical Christians who are pouring ourselves out for the kingdom of God to come. And you know what? If you can't lay down something that you feed your flesh for for 21 days, how are you going to lay your life down for an addict or a broken person? We've got to be part of something bigger. And so we've got to be willing to say, I'm going to put this down because serving Jesus and seeing the kingdom come is way more important than this thing. And I, I fast because in those moments I'm saying, no, it's all about Jesus. It's all about the kingdom of God. I'm going to put myself back on track. I'm going to put my flesh back in its right place. I'm going to embrace the spirit of God. And I'm going to ask, God, will you use me to bring some change to my neighbors, in my family, to my community? And God, will you come and clothe me with your supernatural power? So really, it's an opportunity to step into the power of God. And uh, Jesus says, these things don't go out at one stage. These things you can't cast out. This demon you can't cast out except by prayer and fasting. So if we're serious about seeing the kingdom of God come, we've got to be serious about our faith. We've got to be serious about our prayers. We've got to be serious about our fasting. Sorry if you tuned in for a, for a, a gentle word. But actually, we've got to be serious about these things because people are dying. 
People are aching, people are hurting, and God sent us to be the answer to it. How can we not go? How can we not align our lives? How can we not surrender? How can we not get full of the Spirit of God? How can we not do that? Come on. Your Come on. Your answers reminded me of a preach that Reinhardt did last year when it came to not just being a consumer, to being the contributor into the kingdom of God rather than just taking it in for ourselves. It's being able to use, you know, that and then being able to contribute yeah, elsewhere. So, so much of modern society is about being a consumer. And, but Jesus called us to be contributors, not consumers. Mm. And so, yes, we need to feed our spirits, but then we need to get out. So I'm pleased you mentioned Reinhardt. You didn't mention the slippery potatoes <laughs> part of the preach, but that making a choice not to be a, a consumer, but to be a contributor, I think is key, absolutely key. And I'm sure there are so many people watching today who might have never fasted before or young people who want to start out fasting. How would you say they should go about doing that? And do you have any advice or tips for them as they start? Yeah, um, I... Um, I don't want to say take it gently. I think the easy thing to say is say, well, set the bar really low and see how you get on with that. Um, I'm not sure that's a good idea, actually. Um, I, I'd say to people, if you want to be serious about God, what do you really love? And how much more do you love Jesus than that? And why not say, OK, I'm going to give that up for 21 days. So, so people these days, they love a mobile phone. Look, you can't even be removed from yours this morning. It might also be because it's got the questions on it. But what about laying down your phone for 21 days? Mm. That sounds really extreme, but we're so, we're, if we're not careful, we're more dependent on our technology than we are on hearing the voice of the Holy Spirit. You know, I, I'm a big advocate of food fasts, and, and, and I don't love them, but whenever I fast from food, by the end of the day, even in 24 hours, by the end of the day, if I, if I worship God or I pray for someone, I feel my ability to hear from the Spirit of God is so much more alert. Mm. And one of the reasons I'm a big fan of fasting is I found that happened, and the more I did it, the more I could see the benefit in my spirit, the Spirit of God. Mm. So I'd say, why don't, you try, uh, why don't you try one day just not eating any food and see, make some room to worship and pray as well, but see the difference it makes to your spirit. So I, I'd say to a young person, what do you love? If you love Jesus more, lay it down mm. and, uh, and lay it down. And I love that, uh, that Amy uh, and Sophia talked about maybe doing different things on different days through the 21 days. You might want to do that. You might want to uh, try different things and see how you get on or try one thing for 21 days. Um, it, it doesn't matter, but I would say take a step and see because it really makes a difference to your spiritual life. It really, really, really does. Try it and see, test me and see. It's true, it really makes a difference to your spiritual life. Mm. So obviously this year has been very different from how we had anticipated it going. Given this, where do you see Restore going from here? It's a really good question. Um, and one probably many people have. At the start of this year, God spoke to us about Isaiah 54. And uh, I uh, lost that um, in all the COVID stuff. Um, and recently I've gone back to that passage and I've realized that um, the things that God spoke at the beginning of the year are still true now. They just look a bit different. And in Isaiah 54, God spoke three things to us. He spoke, number one, clear, clear the ground for your tent. Isaiah 54 is about extending your tent. It says, clear the ground for your tent. And we interpreted that that was God saying, make sure you've got a healthy heart. For all of us, we've had more life challenge, I think, in 2020 than we were anticipating. How much more do we need to make sure that our hearts are in a good place? Mm -hmm. How much more do we need to deal with the pain and the challenges, not just brush them down, not just hide them, not just pretend they're not there, but actually bring them out into the presence of God and find healing and restoration? Number two, it was about driving the tent pegs deep. And we interpreted that about our relationships together. And we need one another. And we need to become a community, a church that is a real community of strong relationships. And I think that's just as important as it was then. And then it talks about spreading out to the right and to the left. And the reality is we're now a scattered church. 
We can't physically gather. We are spread out. So God spread us out to the right and the left. I think he spread us out for a reason that we can start to care for our neighbours and our community. I was listening to a guy called Alan Hirsch speak the other day. Really, really good. He was saying that when they train people, people that are really good at playing chess, when they coach them and train them because they think they've got the potential to be world champions, what they do is they remove the queen from the board and teach them to strategize without using the queen. And he said the reason they do that is because the queen is the most powerful piece on the, the chess board, so you can move it in any direction. Mm -hmm. But if you take the queen away, you have to learn how to master all the other pieces. And I think with COVID-19, I, I think the reality for many churches, us included, is we've used Sunday morning as like our queen. And we've thought, we'll disciple our kids on Sunday morning. We'll disciple our youth on Sunday morning. We'll build our good church relationships on Sunday morning. We'll have good hospitality on Sunday mo morning. We'll see the lost saved on Sunday morning. We'll worship on Sunday morning. We'll get a good preach on Sunday morning. God's removed our queen. And that means we have to play differently. The playing differently could be a real strength. What if we think, how do I disciple my kids during the week? Why not just leave it to, why if I not leave it to a Sunday morning? How do I disciple kids? You run a small group, online group for some of our little kids on a sun, uh, in the week. How do we do every day spirituality? How do we do everyday relationships? If we can't gather on a Sunday morning, maybe I've got to walk around the corner or walk up the road to Connie and Vassy or whoever lives just around the corner from me, knock on their door and say, I want to be in relationship with you because we need relationship. I think there's tremendous potential to become a different sort of church. We just need to not make it all about Sundays. We need to make it about me and Jesus how can I still put myself in meaningful relationship with someone else? And to be honest, Sunday morning relationship with people is quite superficial. How can I put myself in meaningful, deep relationship with the person who lives just around the corner from me? And how can I serve my neighbour? Because I'm not disappearing from my neighbourhood to go to church on a Sunday morning. I'm right physically there and I want to shine the light of Jesus into my local community. Awesome. Well... That is my final question. So. Looks like we've got Hayley time. <laughs> Hayley has nicked into the studio. <laughs> Woman of many talents. Yeah, yeah, a couple of questions. Oh, questions. Oh, no. Hang on, we've just got to read them first and then work out. Mm. Oh, oh, that's happy noises, isn't it? Okay. Do you want yeah. me to start? It's up to you. Okay. So your first question, what's the best way for people to ask for private prayer over the coming 21 days? That's a good question. Um, the best way to ask for private prayer over these 21 days, well, every morning, every Sunday morning, we've got a prayer team that are working. And so if you if you're on the Restore website watching this, if you press the live prayer, you'll be put into a private conversation with a member of our prayer team. Mm -hmm. And so you can instantly connect with someone who will either instantly record a prayer request and pray for you or take your details so somebody can ring you or someone can visit you. The other thing you can do is, is email any of us. We're, in terms of the, the staff team, our email addresses are really easy because like mine's ian.king at restorecc.org.uk. So you can go to stuart.hassard at restorecc.org.uk, jody.collins at restorecc.org.uk. I'd say email one of us or take a walk around the corner to someone that you know is a part of Restore and lives around the corner. Knock on their door and say, will you pray for me? You can stand back by a metre because it still works at a metre's length, but just step back. Mm -hmm. But put yourself into community. Shall I ask you one now? That gives sure. me a breathing place. Emma, you've just left school, which you have. Have you any advice for our children, particularly as they start secondary school, on how to live with integrity for Jesus at school? Okay. Um, I'd definitely say... It's so important, I think, in making Christian friends. I'm not going to say that you have to have, all of your friends have to be Christian, but I think it's so important, well, it's so important for me to have a foundation of friendships that have been 
amazing Christians who have really fed into my life, have challenged me in that way. And I think that's really great. And then having those non-Christian friends that you can actually show Jesus' love to really easily, really simply through some of the small things in the way that you care for them and love them and listen to them. So I'd definitely say for me, it's definitely, you know, making those really good godly friendships quite quickly, maybe get yourself involved in, there are probably Christian union sort of things. At most schools, there are definitely some at Davenant, so I'd definitely say that would be what I would do. Okay, so okay. make sure you're well secured yeah. in a strong set of relationships, mm -hmm. and then also, kind of with your other arm, reach out to other people, mm -hmm. but make sure you've got a really good grip of, of foundations and well-connected. Yeah. Great, good. Okay. What's your rhythm for staying connected with God and what stops you from being connected when it comes to God? My rhythm for staying connected with God, um, number one, I, I get up early every day and I spend some time worshipping and praying. And that is my absolute lifeblood. I, I, I know we were in a, when you were small, that was really hard to do because you beat us up um, in terms of not physically beat us up. You, got up before us every morning um, and life had to look different in that season mm -hmm. um, but for me I have to I have to carve out regular time to worship and to pray I've got some prayer guides that I use I put worship on and every day I find some space to sit and be in the presence of Jesus otherwise I feel like everything gets out of perspective um, as I say, when, when you're young parents, I think you have to live more in the grace of God because it's harder to find, particularly in the mornings, I'm a morning person. So that works um, well for me. The other thing I've tried to do this year is take a day a month that I don't have anything in my diary and that I can just go away somewhere and spend some time in, in the presence of Jesus. And that's a day where I can reflect on what God said to me and I can pray over some of the things that um, that I um, may be dealing with um, and make some plans um, to make sure I live out my priorities in the next season. Um, but I think unless you, unless you do some of those disciplines, you wander all over the place. And, and I know the enemy often wants to stop us from doing that, but actually it's about putting the first things first. And I think if we put our relationship with Jesus first and carve time out for that, then we're healthy to deal with the other things. Otherwise, it just doesn't work. And, and I run out of God's resources really quickly and Ian's resources ain't good. So I think you just have to, you have to go back to some of those basics. So I've got a question for you. Um, a bit similar to, this, to that, really. What things will you be putting in place to stay connected with God when you move to uni? So Emma's going to Birmingham University two weeks time you'll be yeah. there. So what things are you putting in place to make sure you stay connected to God when you go through a major life change? So obviously church is looking very different to possibly what I thought it would have been look looking like when I went off to university, but I'm definitely gonna go straight away and get myself involved in churches. There are so many churches doing live streams. And so the plan is to start, you know, going probably to Gas Street Church because it seems absolutely amazing and get myself involved there, get involved in small groups and making myself known to the student workers there just in doing that. But I also want to go and let my faith be known to other people. I don't want it to be something that I kind of hide away and then if somebody says something possibly that I disagree with, for me to just kind of silent, to be silent and kind of complicit with what they were saying about that. And so I think it's definitely doing that and building relationships in the Christian union as well, because I think that will be really important for me going into university, because obviously um, not we can't meet as church, but we can meet as smaller groups in the Christian union or something in person and being able to prayer walk around the accommodation or prayer walk around the actual campus of the university. I think that will be really great for me and I'm really excited to do that and then build amazing godly friendships through that as well as kind of hopefully impacting other people like my flatmates or those who I can come into contact with more regularly who may not know Jesus and his love yet. 
So it's a similar thing in lots of ways to what you said about starting secondary school mm -hmm. in terms of make sure you put your anchors in terms of relationships in really strongly yeah. and instantly connect to a new church community, instantly make your faith be known, instantly find other people who, who love Jesus and intentionally lean into those relationships. Yeah. And then from that, reach out to other people as well. Yeah. Brilliant. Great. Well done. That's as far as we're going to go in terms of, of our conversation this morning. Um, we're going to go back to worship in a moment. I'd just love us to pray and give all of ourselves. We've talked about some of the things we're going to be doing over the 21 days and some of the things we're doing next steps. But it'd be good for us all, I think, to be asking God to give us a clarity of focus over these three weeks and to anchor us into good relationships over these three weeks as well. And so why don't we just take a moment and pray and give ourselves to God and ask God to speak afresh into those things for us, and then we'll pick it up in worship. If you do want live prayer, then just click the live prayer option on your screen and uh, you'll be put into contact with someone. So let's pray. Lord, thank you that you have a calling for each and every one of us. Lord, thank you that each and every one of us are unique, significantly um, uh, anointed uh, by you and the power of your spirit. And thank you, you have a purpose for each and every one of us. And Lord, if we've lost a sense of that, particularly over this last season with so many other things going on, if we've lost a sense of focus and purpose, Lord, I pray over these three weeks, you'll remind us, you'll speak to us again, you'll restore that sense of vision and calling upon our lives. And Father, where uh, one of the themes that seems to have come up this morning is about strong relationships and good anchor points. Father, I pray that you will anchor us really well in community together. Lord, will you uh, put us into deep uh, kingdom uh, friendships where we can grow our roots deep into you and then from there, reach out to other people. So Lord, we put ourselves into you afresh at the start of these 21 days and say, will you use this period to root us more clearly in Jesus and to focus us more clearly on our next steps with our journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen.